So, um, so yes, I'm um, head up the privacy and data protection team at Chelsea, and uh, I have to start by saying that uh, one of the things I've done, probably the, the, sorry, the thing I've done for the past 15 years, is working in uh, um, highly regulated environments, trying to combine, and we've heard this before, trying to combine different regulations, um, as I'm sure you working in digital finance have to do it on a daily basis. And my first piece of advice on this, when you're trying to combine different regulations, and now we are facing a situation whereby GDPR is coming, PSD2 is coming, and to such an extent, some of these things look quite conflicting between each other. So my advice, number one advice, would be don't treat these things separately. And what I've done for the past 15 years is working with businesses and trying to make it work, in, to work, work for them. And I try and explain this by talking about transparency. We've heard about transparency, but I'm going to, because 20 minutes, I'm going to read through um, what is the concept of transparency. So, is transparency a new concept? No, it's not. However, transparency has become very, very important with the GDPR. And it's actually, together with accountability, is the accountability and transparency are actually the most important concept within the new legislation. And they do take a different meaning when we look at directive like PSD2, and I'll get to that. So, in your businesses, when you try and implement GDPR, and at the same time um, work together with the PSD2 and other financial regulations, first of all, is how do you the first step to ensure transparency, which is understand that in your organisation, in your business, what's the definition of personal data. And look, that the definition of personal data under GDPR is not the same as it used to be before. So, um, online identifiers, they do now fall under the category. So it's really important to understand what personal data means to you and to your organisation. So, what are the steps to ensure transparency? First of all, as I said before, is understanding the data that you hold. And once you've done that, it's really try and understand what is the purpose for processing personal data. And what are the legal basis, legal basis for data processing. And this is a very thorough exercise that you have to do under GDPR. It was mentioned before consent, it was mentioned before legal and legitimate interest, contractual basis, and all that. Look, establishing the legal grounds of processing is key because all the data subject rights, all the requests that you will receive from data subjects, they depend on the legal basis for processing. So, for example, take data portability. Data portability applies when you're processing personal data for contractual purposes, or where data has been given to you under consent. The same applies to other rights, data subject rights. So identifying why you're processing the data is one of the most important exercises that you can do under the GDPR. And be very thorough about it. Now, it was mentioned consent, and I want to come back to that. Because I feel that there is a lot of talk about consent, legitimate interest, and the main misunderstanding around the GDPR is that legitimate interest is an easy way to do things. It's not. Because if you say, I'm going to process this data because it's my legitimate interest, oh well, the burden to prove that you're doing the right thing is on to you. And you have to run a balancing exercise. And sometimes I sit down with businesses and say to them, OK, you're claiming that you're using legitimate interest. Can you prove that to me? Can you prove that your legitimate interest does not override the rights of the data subject? And it's not an easy answer. And establish a legal basis for processing is also important if you want to repurpose the data, which you can't. However, however, if you plan to do data analytics, then you have to be very careful whether you use legitimate interest or consent, because um, that will have an impact on whether you can or what, what safeguards you can put in place for data analytics. So pay a lot of attention to that. 
because that is absolutely important. Again, how to ensure transparency. Evaluate and justify retention periods. Now, working in finance, I've worked in Barclays, and uh, um, there, are different, there are conflicting priorities. But the GDPR is helpful in relation to that. Because if you have a legal obligation to retain the data, then you retain it. So justify your retention periods. And this is also important if you get a data subject access request. If you can justify your retention periods based on your legal obligations. Identify which parties within the EU may have access to personal information and establish a legal basis for transfer personal data outside of the EU. Transferring personal data is a very complex issues, issue and you know that you can rely on consent to, to do that, contractual arrangements, but be very careful to making sure that especially if you rely on consent to you're transferring data to a country that has no adequacy status, then you tell the data subject that this is happening. And what are the implications on them if you transfer data uh, to a country which has no adequacy? And of course, it was mentioned before, pay attention to the privacy shield and the, the debate about that. So, as I said before, provide guarantees to individual rights. And this is a key thing about the GDPR. Now, the GDPR is about putting data subject at the heart of whatever you do. And there's all many, or you can you know, talk around it, but the GDPR is about data subjects and it's about privacy rights. And it's about you as a business to try and turn that into a fantastic opportunity to run a customer-focused, customer-centered business, which in turn can be a fantastic marketing opportunity for you. And as I said before, the reason why the lawful ground of processing is so important is because all these, data, all these rights depend on them. And what is the lawful basis that you've chosen, you've chosen for you to process the data? So, GDPR is security, the myth. GDPR is about security, but it's not a security legislation. And this is all, as I say, there is no fixed solution. GDPR is about understanding the law, understanding your risks, and applying the legislation to your business. Encryption for data confidentiality and integrity when you can, secure connections, employee screening, segregation of duty, security by design. These are uh, important steps to, to, to in the insurance transparency. transparency. But the most important thing is risk. The GDPR is not a one-size-fits-all policy. It's not. The first thing about GDPR is understanding the risks to your individual organisation. And always, if uh, uh, it was mentioned before, but it's not a checklist, it's not a compliance checklist, it's really an exercise that applies to your own business. Quickly, from transparency, the most important principle of the GDPR, accountability. Whatever you do, you don't have to just comply with it, but you have to demonstrate that you comply with it. There is no, we don't know what compliance is. And don't trust solutions to say it will make you compliant. We don't know what compliant is. We don't know because the legislation hasn't been tested yet, because we have grey areas. Look, for example, at the interaction with PSD2, but we have grey areas, gray areas within the legislation. So, um, Article 5 and Article 24, very important in the legislation, make sure that you demonstrate that you take any reasonable step to comply with the legislation and record it. And if you do get a data protection authority coming to you and say, oh, can I see your journey? You would have to show them your risk-based approach and every single step that you've taken to um, meet the requirements of the legislation. And as you can say from this, 
is not a one-size-fits-all policy. It really depends on the, your organisation. So what does it mean to be accountable? Accountability, it's lead to guidance within the legislation. But what we know, and it has to be risk-based. What we know is that what the measures that you decide to implement depend on the nature of your organisation. So, Recital 75 defines the risks. Of course, the risks are higher if you process special categories of data. And now, we come to a complication I'll come to in a bit, which is, shortly, which is uh, what it means high risk. And as you know, the PSD2 introduces the concept of sensitive data, which makes the relationship between PSD2 and GDPR a bit complex. But high risk data, they come first. So if you process high risk data, they have to get the priority. And then, and you start from there. So you look into the data that you process, you understand it, try to understand your risks or high risk data, um, and also try to match this with um, your own organization. Uh, so for example, the likelihood of, of um, security breaches happen, or what are the most complex um, data processing that you have. Recital 76 defines that race must be assessed in an objective manner to decide whether they're low or high. The reason why I'm saying all this to you is because this is the background to the implementation of GDPR. And there is no, um, there's no point in starting as a compliance checklist. But really, before you implement anything, is really understand what the GDPR means to you and to your own organisation. These are the list of policies and procedures that you need to put to put in place. And it was mentioned before about the privacy notices. That you need to serve at the right time with the right language. So how do you go about accountability and GDPR? Put in place your data privacy governance structure know your data, create information, notices, and establish your legal grounds for processing data, as we were saying before. And implement your technical and organizational measures. Now, you know GDPR doesn't say much about security. It just says implement technical and organizational measures. So again, it's an assessment that you have to make based on your own, on your own organization. And the key thing, privacy by design. Really don't underestimate that, particularly <laughs> in digital finance. Privacy by design is absolutely crucial. And if you have a moment, go on to the French Authority data, the French Data Protection Authority. The guidance that they've published on privacy by design and privacy impact assessment is absolutely fantastic. I'm going to switch through this just to mention quickly, just to mention very quickly, we've talked about the consent, what is GDPR grade consent. But I just wanted to go into PSD2 and GDPR. It's a topic that fascinates me very much. I find, I don't know you, but I find that there are areas which are very grey in relation to that. And I find that the Information Commissioner in the UK has been very helpful in this, saying we will work together with, with the financial uh, regulator to try and find a way to work together. But in the meantime, we'll just have to navigate through this. And that's what I'm saying to to people, it's really, let's try and navigate this. Now, PSD2 enables data portability. Enables banks to comply with the data portability requirement, which you know what it is, it basically says, you need to be able to, you need to give customers the possibility to port their data in a readable format, and PSD2 enables that. So it enables banks to comply with that. But banks face that combination between this two legislation. And of course, being obliged to give that access to TPPs, this of course poses a risk to security. But there is one question. 
And this is the number one. There's three main issues I see with, you, with the interaction between the two legislations, and I'm trying to help organisations navigate this. The first is data breaches. Now, what is the data controller? It's the bank. Well, when the bank gives access to a third party to a provider, then the third party provider becomes the controller. So there is an issue there not being a contract in place between the two of both having to implement technical and security measures to deal with security and with data breaches. And this is But the elephant in the room about the, the interaction between the two pieces of legislation is consent. Now, in my view, it's a three-step process. Customer sees an option to share data with third-party providers for a specific purpose and signs up. Providers should serve customer a fair processing notice. And consent required also for collateral, collateral activities. I'm seeing third-party providers wanting, for example, to gather consent to access that customer's bank account. But be careful, that doesn't mean that they can market that client. If they want to do that, they have to, co to, to um, collect consent separately. And customer is then directed to the data attribute provider, for example, the bank, to log on and provide consent. So that's how I see the process happening. But now, what does the bank have to do in relation to the third party providers? Does the bank have to make sure that the TPP cannot access information beyond what they should be accessing? So does the bank have to put in place some sort of reduction so that the TPP doesn't access all the information beyond what they are legitimately supposed to, to, to access? So this is why you know, navigating through both regulations is complex. Quickly. Implement cybersecurity, only retain personal data for as long as necessary, and develop a mechanism to implement a withdrawal or consent by the customer. Implement a mechanism to enable you to deal with all subject rights. A very important one, avoid processing data by other individuals that may be mixed up into customer's data. So, for example, the recipient of a payment from the customer. That is not information that a TPP should be able to see. It's not for them. Avoid transferring data to other organisations where possible. And avoid transferring data outside the EEA or make arrangements. And avoid automated profiling unless people have agreed to it. Be careful to automated profiling because even pseudonymized data is personal data under GDPR. So if you do work on uh, on uh, on uh, pseudonymized data, be careful to what the GDPR says about it. So just in a, in a nutshell, the, the, the relationship between PSD2 and GDPR is not an easy one. It requires really a deep understanding of how the two interact, a deep understanding of your organisation, a risk management approach, particularly in relation to the big areas, which is consent, which is definition of sensitive data under PSD2, which is data breaches and where the responsibilities lie, and also in relation to the issue of data scraping, which you know is a complex one because is now being reintroduced, um, at least as a last resort um, for, for banks. Um, I'm going to be around if you want to ask me questions now or later, but that is a very fascinating topic because working across different regulations, not only is possible under GDPR, but it really requires handling all this legislation to get that and not in silos. Thank you. Thank you very much.